I'm so excited to chat with Bridget Aileen Sisko today on the Awakened Feminine podcast. Bridget is the founder of Exalted Publishing House, a podcast host and a visibility coach, helping successful entrepreneurs stand out and be featured as leaders in the industry by sharing powerful stories, writing best-selling books and gaining global recognition. And I know she has so much love and wisdom to share with us today. She's joining me all the way from New Jersey in the USA. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kaki. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to speak to you because you're amazing. But before we dive into our conversation, I always like to ask my guests this question, and it is, what is your definition of an awakened feminine? Mm, It's such a good question. Mm. My definition of an awakened feminine is someone who is in touch with the aspect of self that is the flow, it is the essence, it is the, the softness, the sweetness, it is the receptivity, and it is available for all of us, regardless of, of gender. It is a, a part of self that is somewhat overlooked in our society of how we run our lives and businesses and families and careers. And it's an exciting topic to talk about for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, So let's dive into your journey or just your story, Bridget. Can you share with us why you do what you do? It's literally my favorite question. Mm -hmm. Why I do what I do? Well, of course, like so many people, there's a there's multiple components to the story. And I always like to take it back to my first awakening experience, I guess we can call it, which for me was a massive healing experience. And also this opportunity to start on a spiritual journey at a a quite young age. So, you know, I was in my teenage years and started having a lot of health issues and going to doctors after doctor, after doctor with no definitive answer of what this was. And finally, I went to a specialist who said, this is Lyme disease, and it tends to show up and manifest in people's bodies in really, really different ways. And doctors have a really challenging time to define this. And it was great to have a diagnosis, but there was still so much frustration that it brought up in the journey for me of not feeling like my symptoms were heard or seen. So a seed was planted at a very young age When I went to a doctor's office, I brought all of my medical history because I started to connect the dots, everything in the body is interrelated. And he didn't look at it. He didn't care to see of something that I felt was really important in this like mystery diagnosis, you know, journey. Mm -hmm. And there was a seed planted at that time that literally said, voices matter, your voice matters, and you're going to help people share their voice. Now, obviously at the time I wasn't like, I'm going to do this with women from all over the world. (laughs) It was just one of those little seeds that was there in the beginning. And I'd say that coupled with, as I ventured out deeper on a spiritual journey and started to feel different from those around me in the high school, college, after college years, I felt very alone. And this led me to become a yoga teacher, to study Ayurveda, to beginning hosting women's circles. And to find this love of hosting and bringing people together. So part of what I do now is literally bring people together from all over the world, inspire them to share their story, inspire them to use their voice and speak and feel seen and feel heard. And those are some of the most pivotal moments in my life of why this matters. (laughs) Yes. And very profound. Can I ask you how old you were when you went to the doctor's office and he just did not want to listen to what you had to say? Yeah. um, I was in the range of 13 to 17. And I know that sounds like a big period, but I was dealing with these things like for so many years. And what's important about that age range is it's when you're trying to define like sense of self, like you're Mm -hmm. trying to figure out the world and people around you and relationship to people and things around you. It was a confusing time to have that, that health experience. Mm. Can I ask you, you were saying that you were, you felt quite different to your peers as you were going, going through this period as well, having not feeling well with Lyme disease and working through that. How then did you 
what what was different about you to your peers? Because like you were saying, at that age, it's very much about finding, you know, who you are and how you fit into the world and society and everyone around you. Yeah. It's such a good question. I always defined myself as like a dichotomy of sorts because I'm very sociable and it was very easy for me to fit in and be liked and have friends. But then there was this other part of me that knew about holistic healing that understood that our purpose on this planet wasn't just to go to college, have a job and go through that cycle. So as I went into high school and college and had lots of friends and had incredible experiences, when I was about to finish college, I started to have these feelings of just not wanting to do the same things that I'd been doing, aka going out, drinking, partying, and then going to the ashram like in the morning. I was living this like double life of sorts, um, being the yogi, but also being highly sociable. And there came a point where I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to just fit in that way anymore. So I began to seek out podcasts. <laughs> books, other types of communities, like going to this ashram where people were on a spiritual journey, much older than I, but it didn't matter at that point. I just wanted to be part of something that, um, and a space where people understood me a little bit better. Mm. You were saying that you felt alone. Was it because you were living this double life it, that you felt alone, even though you were quite sociable? Isn't it funny? How yeah. we use these words, even though on the outside it, it would look like that. Um, yeah, the time where I, I really started to feel alone was when I started to deepen onto my spiritual journey. You know, I'd started started reading like the universe has your back, listening to all these spiritual podcasts, and my friendships around me, some of them were really strong and they supported me for this, but many of them didn't understand that part of me. And to no issue of their own. It was just, we were beginning to be on two different paths and it was challenging to understand that not every friendship is going to go in the same exact direction as I started to kind of, you know, veer off to the mm -hmm. side, not say yes to going out at night anymore, you know, spending my mornings not hungover and instead at a yoga class. So that feeling of uh, of being alone was just as I started to veer onto this path of being a little different from from those who I'd surrounded myself with for years and years and years. Mm, I totally get that. When you go on your spiritual journey, it is quite it can feel quite lonely because it is a very is very sacred time for you to connect with yourself. So it's lonely in that no one else can really walk it with you. Is that the feeling? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it really is so personal. And for me, I was at least just seeking people and communities who understood my language, who understood my my need and my yearning to, you know, journal every morning when I got up or do some inner healing work or talk about astrology and the Akashic records and and not look like look at me like I have 17 heads. <laughs> I love that. And you started at such a young age. I mean, I didn't get started until I was, gosh, 30 something. <laughs> so, you know, starting from such a young age, especially at at that age, most people would be partying and going out and all that. So <laughs> you would have had to have some very, very supportive friends to be able to, you know, see you through this time as well. So that's really cool that you know, you were able to just do things your own way, which is something as a society, you know, being we just program not to do things our way. We have to follow these set of rules. Like you said, go to college, get a good job and work for the rest of your life, buy a house, pay the mortgage, all those things that we're supposed to do to live a life that everyone else says is successful. Yeah. But I love that you went out to do something else. Can I ask you, so going on to your health journey, so you had Lyme disease and then you already knew somehow that everything was interconnected, interconnected in your body. When was that, like, when did that click for you as a young person that it wasn't, you know, just a disease diagnosed by a doctor, but it was everything in your body, in your, all your bodies connected somehow to manifest this, this disease within you? 
I am very, very lucky and grateful that I had a lot of support from my mom and of course my father on this journey too. But my mom was already attuned and open to alternative ways of healing. She had been in a, a major um, bike accident a couple of years before and had been on her own, you know, healing journey because of that with mindset, with food, with nutrition. So I had some seeds planted. Um, at quite a young age. And she was the one who would bring me to all the doctors. She would bring me to the chiropractors, the acupuncturists, the specialists, because she too actually experienced Lyme disease as many other people in my family did and began to connect the dots that the antibiotics that the doctors were giving us just, it, it, it wasn't getting to the root cause of the issue. So I had that seed planted. And then as my frustration grew, I started to do my own research. So you know, there I am in my teens, Googling everything, Googling how to get to the root symptom, you know, like get to the root cause, get to the root. And I found Ayurveda, Mm. um, which was a huge, huge pivotal part of my journey. I went on to study it. I went on to, to teach workshops on Ayurveda. And what it taught me is that number one, we are all unique. We all have unique constitutions. We all have unique um, ways of being and how our systems work and and what's good for one might be poison for another. So that was huge. I realized it wasn't a one size fits all to anything Mm -hmm. in life. And I also realized that as a society, we are highly disconnected from nature and the natural world and that these are pivotal pieces to our makeup. However, we are not looking at them at all. So it really brought me back to connection with nature, connection with my body, connection with um, the love for myself and who I was as a unique individual. And all of those things really helped me to see that the body is all connected. And what I had been told wasn't necessarily uh, supporting me in the way that I needed the support. Mm, Wow. I'm just starting to learn about Ayurveda. So it's, it's, Amazing and um, a mutual friend of our Sarah. Obviously, um, I think that's actually she's the one that kind of got me interested because she was talking about my like, oh, so then I started Googling and it is very much a very holistic balance balancing your body back in getting your body body back into balance, isn't it? Yeah, basically the idea is that we have this something called um the prakriti when we're born and it's this born state it's the born nature where all is all is perfect all is whole but we go through life and we you know eat food that doesn't serve us there's environmental toxins there are relationships that don't serve us we do things every single day that don't serve us and we move further away so ayurveda is about bringing yourself into balance using the seasons in nature using food um, using relationship it, it the whole it's a holistic system to bring us back and it just makes sense Mm. Just makes sense. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> like you say, we're very disconnected from nature and how our body is, you know, meant to function because we put all this crap and there's all these external things outside. You know, stress is something that is that is just can't can't think of the word, but it <laughs> but it's just a big part of our lives and our body is not supposed to be constantly operating under stressful environments. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, so you you found Ayurveda, then did you kind of just go into it and then things started getting better? How, how did it, how, what did it look like as in changing your health and getting you back to into balance? It's a very hard question for me to answer because as I look back and I've even asked my mom this, like so many times I'm like, mom, like, what was it? And it's like, it wasn't one thing. It was like all of the things I had, I was getting regular blood work. I was getting B12 injections because I was severely um, low on B12 energy. I had digestive issues because of all the antibiotic use. I had reproductive issues. So it was this whole journey of working with a specialist and then also adding in understanding and knowledge of Ayurveda, of taking care of my body, of having a different relationship with food and self. So it's not a direct answer, which doesn't Mm. make it, you know, easy, but it's what worked for me and we're all unique. So it's not going to sound the same for someone else. Yeah. I totally understand. Um, It's not a one size fits all. It never has been and it never will be one size fits all. Can I ask you, did you know you said the doctor didn't listen to you? Did you 
end up finding another doctor that actually listened to what you had to say? Yes. Um, and I thank that doctor, like, thank you because you gave me purpose. Like he literally gave me purpose because I was so upset. I left there crying and yes, we found a different doctor. We never went back to him. Um, it, it was all okay. And I think for anyone listening to this, it is important to, to speak up for yourself and find someone who, who listens to you because you as the, the patient um, or the client, like it's your choice too. It's not just what this person says. You can go to someone else. And I think that's an important part of this conversation. <laughs> mm. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it shouldn't be made to be like, you know, do anything to your body without you actually wanting to do it. So right. I'm glad you found your doctor. So that's really cool. Which then brings me to getting your voice heard. Why, like, obviously there's that doctor incident where you felt that you weren't heard. Were there other incidences in your life where you felt like your voice wasn't heard and which, you know, brought you to do what you do now? Mm. Not that we're as large as that, mm. but when I was in college, I was part of a professional business fraternity where we focused on the stock market. We focused on public speaking. And what I realized is that I loved public speaking. It was very fun for me. I was in my natural state and it was such a polarizing experience, right? To have this situation of feeling like your voice wasn't heard and then realizing that you love speaking and you love using your voice. So the way I see life is like, I call it the puzzle pieces of existence. There are these little things that little moments that aren't big necessarily, but they plant these little seeds to help us make sense of life. So I had the situation of feeling like my voice was not heard. I had the situation of feeling like my voice is powerful and I'm naturally good at this and I like to do this. So how can we use both of those experiences and create something new from there, which ultimately led me into what I'm doing now? Mm. And the part of helping women, what is it about helping women that really lights you up? Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> I just think back for, for centuries of women's voices being suppressed. You know, the man is the head of the household. The man brings in the bills. The women are, are to, the, to the wayside in many cultures and societies and don't have the ability to speak up. In many cases, whether it's about their health, whether it's about a relationship, whether it's about their wants, needs, and desires, whether it's about their future. So I think there's been something planted within our societal makeup that has been a pattern for many, many years. And we still carry that, you mm. know, as women feeling like, you know, we're not really good enough to, to say something. Well, we'll let we'll let him do it. So with that being said with the advent of social media, the ability to start businesses online these days, and this feeling like women still didn't have the ability to speak and like stand in their power and use their voice. I'm thinking in my mind, this is incredible. I'm going to help them use their voice. I'm going to help them feel so confident in what they do. I'm going to help them understand their message. I'm going to help them understand their mission. And I'm going to help them feel empowered to speak it to the world. Mm -hmm. now I'm it. getting excited I know and you do it so well because um, you do it in a variety of ways so can you share with us what are some of the ways that women can use their voice to help other women or even men really yeah everyone right yeah. Uh, everyone um, one of the ways is through publishing books and I believe that Actually, I'll take the step back. So I'm also a yoga teacher. And one of my favorite things about teaching yoga and studying yoga is the science of sound. And it's the science of mantra, which is a tool to redirect the mind, right? A mantra, a mind tool. And there are different types of sound, right? Sound is everything, but sound can be written. Sound can be spoken. Sound can be the thoughts in our mind. 
Mm. So there's so many different ways that we can bring sound into the world. And what matters is what we repeat, what we repeat, especially when it's in our mind, what we say, what we write. So for some people, it's literally, I'm going to go the writing path. I'm going to, to, to write my story down in a way that I can share it with others. For some, it's the speaking path. It's the what we typically think of as using our voice. It is getting on a podcast like this or being a guest expert in a group or being interviewed or sharing on a stage. And there's a lot of fear that comes up for women around that as well. Or it might just be in your relationship, like literally being able to speak up for yourself. And it, it relates to so many things that we do in our life. Mm. I'm very interested. I mean, this might be a little bit off topic, but you were saying that sound is writing and thoughts. And I'm like, oh, okay. How does that work? Can you explain that a bit more? (laughs) Yeah. So the way I've understood mantra and sound is that sound is the basis of all things. It's atoms and ions vibrating at a certain frequency. And the way that mantra works. So when you say something out loud or when you write it, you're repeating, repeating, it's called japa and you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, which is used to um, reprogram the subconscious mind. So I believe that what we continuously say to ourselves, what we continuously write about ourselves, like if we're writing my life sucks, my life sucks, my life sucks, my life sucks. (laughs) If we're literally saying that as our, our, our narrative out to the world, that is, Mm. That is because sound is its creation in yeah. form, whether it's in the mind, whether it's written, whether it's spoken. So I am very discerning with the sound I allow into my space, the people, the relationships, the conversations, the books, the media, the news, because I know it programs. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking about sound in that respect is like your, I guess, more mainstream is like the vibration and the frequency Mm -hmm, that you mm -hmm. emit and receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, I just had to understand (laughs) a bit more because it's like sound is, yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. most people think you hear it, but I get get what you mean now. That's really cool. So um, in terms of women, oh, well, people, writing their stories how have you found that to help them and help others like you know being in that field it'd be really good to just share what you've seen the changes in the people writing and also the people on the other side reading the stories or hearing about the stories something that I never really thought about until I got into what I'm doing now is this the role as the the storyteller and the role as the story receiver. And both are very important. Now for the storyteller, there is something deeply cathartic that happens when you write. It's just like if you're journaling and maybe you're frustrated and you realize that after like a page or two of just writing it all down, you've moved through something. You kind of left that beyond it and redefined your direction, which is what is happening for the women who are writing in these books. I'll give you an example of the last book that we did called Lineage Speaks, Women Who Carry the Torch for Future Generations. It was a lot about family, DNA, lineage, the stories, the narratives that are super embedded in the family structure from generation to generation. And I wasn't expecting this to happen. Mm. Many of them, the authors, gave the book to a parent or someone in their family, and actually opened up conversation around the the topics. Healing happened, relationship repair happened, things that I could have never expected to have occurred from it. But there's something that I almost see it as a portal. There's something that opens up when we go to write and share the story. There's healing that happens. There's this ability to say, I'm not defined by my past. Mm -hmm. when you look at it in a different way. So that's the one perspective of like the storyteller, the healing, the clarity that can also come through when writing. The story receivers, the people who are receiving 
the words, people who are receiving the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the inspiration. And I always like to think of this from some of the first books that I read. It was planting a seed within me. It was opening me up to possibility. It was sparking imagination, inspiration. And most importantly, the feedback we've received from those who have read these books are it showed me what's possible. I realized I'm not alone. And I realized there are so many people that are just like me on this journey. And Mm -hmm. stories surpass everything. They surpass culture. They surpass race, religion, amount of money that you make. Like stories humanize us. And that's what's so deeply healing for both parties. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I've got full body goosebumps going on as you were talking. Um, Because, I mean, right now I'm in in your portal, your beautiful portal, um, because writing a new book and it is it is very healing for the person writing it just you know from my experience writing this is my second time writing the book so um and a lot of resistance comes up which is where the healing happens (laughs) is that something that's normal (laughs) Thank you for reminding um, me of that. (laughs) Absolutely. It's so normal. It's so normal because we're literally bringing things up to the surface that maybe we haven't, (laughs) we've kind of like left them in the trunk for a little while. And now they're sitting in the passenger seat with us. So we have this ability to see them and then say, okay, how do I want to define my relationship with this thing? Now that it's in my awareness, how do I want to move through it? How do I want the relay to be and how do I want to share this with others? So there's this whole process that happenings happens as you write, and it can be uncomfortable. It can feel very unclear at times. You can be like, "Why the heck would I decide to do this? <laughs> this was a bad idea." But then you break through, and the only way out is through, right? And then you break through, it and you have this just moment of ah, uh, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And it's a beautiful feeling when you get to that, uh huh, mm-hmm. okay moment. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> I want to ask you with, um, you know, sto- um, stories, like you were saying, the person that receives you know, the story and how they go, wow. I, f- I don't feel as alone, it's planted seeds, it's, you know, open their eyes up, they don't feel so lonely, there's other people like me. What is, you know, what do you think is something that as a collective we can do to help bring more people together? Because obviously there's, we are all so alike in so many ways, you know, we just want to be love. We want to love. We want to feel joy. We want to feel kindness from people. We want to feel peace and calm, you know, all the, you know, high vibrational type emotions. That's what we want to feel. Yet, you know, we're stuck in jobs we hate. We don't know who we can talk to about the toxic relationship we're in, you know, and all the other things that, uh, you know, friendships that we that are long past out the expiry date and all the other things. How can we, what, you know, this is a big <laughs> topic, but yeah, what do you believe is something that we can do to just bring more people together so they can feel that, well, no, not feel, no, that they're not alone and that they can, there are people like them that's walked, you know, before them, behind them to bring them together to, you know, heal even more? Such a good question. And it's a big question, but it's just. But it's something I think about a lot. Mm. And the one thing that comes to me immediately is it's okay wherever we're at right now, because we also live in a society that tends to point out our differences rather than our similarities Mm -hmm. Right for money, for power, for greed, for ratings. And if we can have the acknowledgement of that and then take this step back and say, well, okay, they're pointing out all the differences, but what are all the similarities between me and the person across the world or me and the coworker sitting next to me? You know, is it possible that we are actually a lot more similar? 
And that's why I love to go back to like basic root things like food, like everyone eats Mm. every single day. I've been watching travel documentaries for like my entire life. It is like my love and joy to understand culture and, and see how people relate and hospitality and, and food connects us regardless of all the other, mm. you know, circumstance stories, they connect us like real, how are you really feeling today? Kind mm. of questions, you know, it's like, I'm actually feeling quite overwhelmed <laughs> today. <laughs> and then that person next to you goes, me too. Like, how can we just support one another because we have a society that that wants us to put forward the best face all the time, which is also good. However, we've forgotten about the real human experience, which is experiencing all emotions and experiencing it all. So to try to answer your actual question here, <laughs> how can we see the beauty in, in all? How can we connect to the beauty of all? And I say coming back to simplicity of this life, and it brings me directly to nature and the planet and realizing our connectionness versus our differences. Mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you say you have a lot of women's circles that you host. I know you're hosting a retreat coming up soon as well. So you know, things like that where people can tap into other people that obviously want to find people that are like them, right? Um, Are there, you know, I'm going to ask you with your women's circles, what kind, do you have different circles or are they, is it one big circle? Like how (laughs) did... How do your circles work? <laughs> yeah. So I used to host them in person. That's what I was doing um, a couple of years ago. We typically gather anywhere from 10 to 20 women on a certain topic. We would do some journaling. I would always share some Kundalini meditation or mantra. Say it was for prosperity. Say it was for um, removing negative thought patterns. You know, we'd always have a focus and we'd all have the ability to just share at the end, use our voices and to really just listen, like just listen to what that person across from you is saying. So that's what that looks like. And I still do host those from time to time. Now in my business, everything is like one big women's circle. What (laughs) the way I run my multi-author books in the publishing company is like, it's a women's circle when we come together on zoom. So each person you know, has the ability to, to use their voice, to be seen and heard, to share what's really real for them and to just be in that space of whatever it is without judgment, comparison, um, and to just, to just be there. So I love facilitating groups and that's typically how I uh, structure my offerings in the business too, because it's, it's fun for me and I see how healing it is for mm-hmm. others. Yeah. And you've got such a beautiful energy. I love being around you. (laughs) If only I can touch you right now. (laughs) A bit too far away right now. Uh, But um, yeah, I really do believe in the power of circles or groups, whatever you want to call them, but coming together with a group of people that, you know, there's a shared interest and knowing that, they're there to help support you and not be judgmental because, you know, there's so much judgment in this world. We don't need any more of that. But being a safe place, a safe space, Mm -hmm. which is then where we can empower people to use their voices because I think women suppress those voices because they don't feel safe. So if we can offer more of these circles or groups where we can actually have women that feel safe so they can use their voice. And then once they feel safe in the group, then they can go out into the big wide (laughs) world (laughs) to start using their voices there. Yeah. It's, and you made me think of something that I forgot to mention before. I personally tend to work with the women who are 
maybe healers, maybe yogis, like they have that deep, deep spiritual backbone. And there's also this massive fear for a lot of them of what will people think of me? Are people going to think this is weird when I start talking about listening to my spirit guides, you know, on my next Instagram live. <laughs> so when you join in a, in a community of people who are, are saying, yes, it's safe to talk about that. And what I like to remind people is we are not selling McDonald's hamburgers here. Like the work that we're doing is meant to reach people because mm-hmm. it is work of empowerment. It is work of healing. It is work of nourishment. It is, it is work of relationship and healing relationship and, and understanding your power. Like this is important work. And these are important messages that need to be shared because imagine a world where more people felt empowered, loved themselves and loved others. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I would love that world to happen. <laughs> yes. And we're part of it. Yes, we are. And I love how you brought up um, that you know, the people in your group are healers and you know, it's like, yeah, I listen to my spirit guides. <laughs> Especially, I mean, I told you before, I'm a pharmacist by trade. Mm-hmm. And then also I teach people how to trade. And now I teach people how to trade on the stock market. And then the whole stock market, pharmacists and spirit guides don't usually mix in one sentence. (laughs) I think they do perfectly. I think it makes you so, it makes you so unique. It makes you so yourself. And I see the threads through it all. Like it makes sense to me. (laughs) Yeah, it makes sense for me too, but (laughs) for most people, (laughs) it doesn't. Oh, Bridget, I just love our conversation. Can I ask you, you know, right now, if you can go back to your younger self, you know, having done everything that you've, you're doing and have done, what's that key piece of advice that you would tell young Bridget? Hmm. I would tell young Bridget to keep dreaming big and starting small, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Mm. That's beautiful advice. I love that. Mm. Mm. My inner child's so happy. Yeah, <laughs> I like, can yes. feel. I can feel her going. Yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so beautiful. And we just touched on self love just now that if everyone loves themselves and, you know, spread their love to the world, how awesome would the world be? Can you share with us what does self-love mean to you? Self-love to me means just having an acceptance of who I am, where I'm at in the very present moment. It is not bound by societal ideals. It it just is. It's a beingness. And of course, there are tools and practices that help me come back to that center because I'm human too. And, you know, there are those days when you're not feeling so hot and you're like, this is not it, right? (laughs) So we have the tools, you know, I go out in nature. I spend time with my husband and my dog. I take a bath. I do some meditations to come back into that space because as humans, it can be hard to be there all the time. And I don't think we're meant to be there all the time because the polarity is what teaches us. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Bridget. And before we wrap up, I'd love you to share with us what's setting your soul on fire at the moment. Oh, what is setting my soul on fire? I just love talking (laughs) yes I realize that (laughs) you can feel it I just love interviewing people I love gathering people together I love inspiring women to to stand in their power and use their voice and to just go big and I'll be unapologetic about it be completely unapologetic about it so you'll see for me soon I'm going to have a new talk show starting called past the sovereignty which will be very fun. Cocky will absolutely be on the show. Um, We're going to continue to put out some incredible books where we're doing just these things. And I'm just so happy. I'm so grateful. I, you know, like I feel teary because it's like, wow, like 
It is. It's all here. And it's all so beautiful. And the people I have met, it's just, it's so amazing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love you so much. You just are <laughs> such a beautiful person. And I can just feel that loving energy through the screen. And I'm get, I'm going to start crying. Mm-hmm. So I'm going <laughs> to Okay. Yeah. So I just want to thank you so much for this beautiful conversation we're having tonight for me. I know it's morning over there where you are. And if people want to find out more about you and how they can work with you, where can they go? Yeah. Um, So feel free to connect with me on Instagram. My handle is at blissfulbridget. And if you want to check out some of our offerings, so whether you want to be in our next multi-author books, if you want to put on your own book and write yourself, let me know. Um, If you want to be part of any of our visibility coaching programs, you can find any of this on the website. It's www.bridgetaileen.com. You'll probably have to look at the show notes to see how my middle name is spelled. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing your love and wisdom. And thank you. Thank you for being my life. Thank you. Thank thank you for being on the show.